Hi, this is Mark Arnold with another Fun Ideas podcast. And on today's show, I have the legendary Trina Robbins. Thank you for joining me today. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, I've interviewed you before. I've met you before. And, uh, you know, I was like, I decided for this time, since we're probably going to talk for about an hour, um, I was like looking through your career and I go, geez, you got so much stuff you've done over the years. Um, I have, uh, I, I think, you know, our friend Lee Hester, uh, he runs Lee's comics and, uh, he, he's been begging me for years. I've done this for like three years, get Trina Robbins on the show, get Trina Robbins on the show. So thank you, yeah. Lee. <laughs> um, also another one he was saying is, uh, Mary Fleener. And I just, interviewed oh my her. God. Yes. Yeah. Mary is wonderful. You'll love her. Yeah, and so I interviewed her a couple of weeks ago, yeah. and so I got her on the show. And uh, since we're talking about female cartoonists, uh, and we probably will continue to do that, considering your career, uh, I interviewed Sherry Flanagan earlier this oh, year. Oh, another one who was truly wonderful, yeah. yes. And I admire all of you people. <laughs> um, uh, really love your recent books. I don't have the book in front of me. I have postcards because uh, they're all packed away right now. But I mean, here's uh, the Flapper Queens. Yes. And Gladys Parker. I got these down. When That's I... not out yet. That's oh, this coming is not out, out yet. Okay. No. I thought this one was. Oh, you know what? I'm confusing this with um, your other book. Uh, sorry about that. Um, one of the other female cartoonists that you did a book on. I have all my notes here. Nell Brinkley? Probably that one. Yeah. Nell Brinkley or uh, even Tarpy Lily Nell? Renee. I don't know. You've done a lot of them. And we'll probably I did a graphic about novel about Lily Renee. Yes. Okay, so this one definitely I do remember, but I don't have the book in front of me. So I, I happen to be down in San Jose for the first time in two years, considering uh, this pandemic. I'm up in Oregon now, and uh, uh, I went down to Elusive Comics. Uh, oh, yes. And, and uh, they have a lot of your stuff there and a lot of your books. And I go, yeah, and uh, Anne's very, very good person and everything like that. So. Yes. So how are you today? <laughs> I'm I'm awake. Okay, <laughs> That's how I am. No, okay. I'm fine. I'm I'm all vaccinated, even flu and boosted yeah. and everything else. So Me I'm too. good. Good. And if we did this two weeks ago, like I think we were originally trying to, I got my flu and uh, booster shot as well because I'm a frontline worker in my real life. <laughs> and uh, it really knocked me out. I was just like in bed all day. So I wouldn't have done this on a Saturday. Wow. But I'm you back. Know, yeah. only, only my second uh, COVID shot uh, knocked me out. Even And really just in a, in a very little way, the, yeah. the day after the shot, I, yeah. I, I had like one degree fever, but I felt it. Yeah, that was like me. The first one, nothing. Second no. one, I thought, oh, it'll be nothing too. And then it was a delayed reaction about two days later. It was later. something. Yeah. And boy, it was like I had chills and I kept turning up the heat. And, you know, and this is like in April. And it's like, you know, I don't need the heat in April usually. <laughs> and, then, and then I get overheated and sweat and I turn it back down, you know, and it went on for like a day and a half. And then, you know, I'm fine. And then I was prepared. So I got my, uh, my shots on Friday, figuring, if something happens, I got the weekend to, to like relax and it didn't really hurt me physically. It just made me really tired. So I just napped all day and watched old TV shows and stuff like that. <laughs> Amazingly, I've been okay. I mean, with the shots, I haven't really had bad reactions. Oh, very good. So how we usually start on these podcasts, I mean, we're just doing a little chit chat here, but, um, and it, this is a weird question to ask you because you've done so many things. So if you can kind of make it brief, <laughs> tell me a little bit about yourself. And I guess because you're doing writing nowadays, but you know, you've done artwork and you've done clothing design and a zillion other things. How did you kind of break into everything that you do? <laughs> For everything, huh? Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, let's start with clothing. Okay. okay. My father was a tailor and hmm. he taught me to sew you know, on a sewing machine. He taught me to use a sewing machine. Um, but then of course, for a long time after I left home, I didn't have a machine because you have to buy them. And I was poor as a church mouse. Mm. Um, 
but I always, I loved clothes and I could never afford the clothes I wanted. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so we'll kind of flash forward to when I was living in LA and married and my husband bought me a sewing machine for my birthday because <laughs> he knew how badly I, I wanted clothes. Um, and I kind of locked because my father had taught me to use a, an old fashioned treadle machine. That's what he used. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to learn how to use an electric machine. And I did that by simply locking myself in a room with the machine and, <laughs> and not opening the door until I had mastered the machine. And um, I started making clothes and I made the things that I wanted to wear, you know, and, and I just got, as I sewed, I got more and more experimental. I used um, interesting fabrics, a lot of velvets. I used old lace uh, laces, um, just bits and pieces of interesting fabrics, you know, you know, antique, antique um, embroidered pieces, things like that. And at a certain point, because I had all these ideas of what I wanted to make, at a certain point, I had too many clothes. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you, your closet can only hold so much. <laughs> and so I, but I still wanted to make these clothes. So I started selling at crafts fairs. Hmm. And um, also at this point, my ex-husband and I were going to, we were really into the whole Sunset Strip rock and roll scene. Yeah. So I was wearing my clothes to these, these clubs and people noticed them and wanted them, mm -hmm. including, you know, rock and roll people, you know, uh, mus musicians and their wives. Um, <clears throat> So at, in 1966, I left Los Angeles and moved to New York. And the first thing I noticed was that I thought the clothes were very tame <laughs> and I knew that I could do better. Mm -hmm. And I rented a storefront and filled it with my clothes and opened a store and voila, that's how it happened. Hmm. And that store was called Broccoli, is that correct? Yes, yes. <laughs> Now, did you ever think, uh, you know, since the Beatles did Apple, you know, that you were like a influence on them in any way? I, I, I doubt it. But um, we all had cute names, you know, yeah. and people, they still have cute names. Mm -hmm. Now, how did, uh, did, you know, you said all these rock and rollers and I'll name drop a few like Mama Cass Elliott you know. and uh, David Crosby and Jim Morrison did they Donovan. just come up donovan was one donovan leach uh and uh did they just come upon your store or did you solicit uh you just froze go ahead oh there okay we, we, can you say all that freeze. again just keep going yeah if we sure. freeze okay sure. yeah. what was the question um you know all these uh different rock and roll stars and everything did they just stumble upon your store or did you solicit uh their oh well we, we knew or, the birds well, we were very good friends with the birds and david in fact was like my favorite bird <laughs> he was my best bird friend um and um at a certain point the the musicians just started coming over because the birds would recommend them to us or yeah. recommend us to them mm -hmm. um it was David who brought Mama Cass over and she needed, she couldn't find anything nice in her size. In those mm -hmm. days, they just weren't making anything nice in plus sizes. So I made her stuff that was nice. So that all, all that like psychedelic stuff, you know, that she wore typically like say on the Ed Sullivan show or things like that, was that um, designed by two you? Two dresses that I made for her were on the Ed Sullivan show. Yes. Cool. cool. <laughs> and. Um, so when you now you were born in Brooklyn, so did you move back and forth? Is that what happened? Um, I lived in New York for a while after leaving home, uh -huh. and then I moved to LA mm -hmm. and lived there from 1960 to 66. Okay, and <clears throat> excuse me, and then I wound up in New York, um, and in December of 1969 i moved here to san francisco okay. and i'm staying yeah and if for you know i didn't do as much research about you i just thought you were 
born and bred, raised in San Francisco, because I just think of you as a well, San Francisco am, person. You know, I've been living there, living there since since December 1969. Living here since yeah. December 69. Well, not not exactly here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, when you moved uh, to LA or San Francisco, did you have any clothing stores there, or did you just do? No, the I just sewed from my own home. Oh, okay. All right. And um, then how did that parlay uh, into doing comic book art? Were you doing that at the same time? Or uh, did you meet people by doing your clothing uh, that parlayed into that? Or how did that work? Well, you know, the early 60s, I don't know, when, when was the Batman show on TV? 66 to, six, 66 to 68. Oh, six, as late as 66? Yeah. Okay. Well, it was like pop art was suddenly really, really hip and the Batman show. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized that all these drawings I had been doing, I just drew for myself, but I realized that all these drawings I was doing were really proto comics. Mm. And I started, you know, really drawing comics. At first they were very simple and they were also very spacey. Um, they didn't necessarily say anything or maybe if you got high enough they might say something i don't know um but it was when i got to new york and visited the east village other which mm -hmm. was the big underground newspaper for the lower east side which was the hip neighborhood um which i think still is um mm -hmm. and i did i met the uh the publisher and the editor of the east village other and um, did a drawing for them, just just not necessarily for publication, just because I did it and I gave it to my, actually what I did was I went to the offices, these village other offices mm -hmm. and uh, shoved it under the door because no one was there and they published it. Mm -hmm. So voila, suddenly I was drawing comics for an underground newspaper. Now, what was the other like? Was it kind of like the Village Voice or more underground? No, the Village Voice was much, much more, um, well, just tamer. I mean, they they hardly were, you know, they they weren't like an ordinary newspaper. I mean, they right. were always different, but they were they were kind of like almost for an older crowd and a tamer crowd because they were for the West Village, from the West Village. Oh, okay. The West Village was tame. Mm -hmm. um, and Evo, East Village Other, was just very psychedelic mm -hmm. and in, in, in layout and design also. Okay. Um, was it similar to other publications? Like, I think I've heard of Evergreen. Is that one of them from back then? I never heard of Evergreen, but it was, it was it basically, yeah, it was basically your typical underground newspaper. Okay. Yeah, I think Evergreen is where Michael O'Donohue originated. Ah, from. really? Yeah. <laughs> and um, now, um, did you try to go into the mainstream comic book world at that time, since you were in New York, obviously, in Marvel and DC, or did that not interest you? It didn't interest me. Uh, I mean, I, I liked the comics, but they were they were straight. You know, the superheroes all had short hair and the guys who drew them had no idea what real women looked like. And they certainly didn't draw counterculture women. I mean, it was something that I couldn't really relate to because mm -hmm. I was completely counterculture. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the comics that I did and that other underground cartoons did were, you know, well, you've seen them. They were counterculture. Yeah. Yes, yeah. That's where I first saw your material. I think the very first thing I ever saw, uh, strangely enough, was in when Marvel published Comics Book. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's that like was I wasn't 73? trying to find your material. It was just that's where I saw it. And then I realized, oh, you've done a lot of other stuff, too. <laughs> you know, so but uh, so that did help, like, bring some of that stuff into the mainstream. Of course, I was a little kid when that came out, so I wasn't supposed to be reading that, you know, <laughs> but I did anyway. Um, I'm kind of surprised, but you might not have been in New York at that point. Uh, yeah, you were in San Francisco, that you never yes. tried to be in the Lampoon or anything like that, or did that not? No, I did stuff for Lampoon. What are you talking about? Oh, you didn't know? Was, well, was I that early? Mm, no, it was in the 70s. 
<laughs> Sorry, <laughs> er, yeah. well, I should know this too because I started in the '60s. There was no national lampoon in the '60s. True, it was true. only the Harvard lampoon. Um, <laughs> lampoon started in the '70s, and I was yeah. I was published in it very very quickly. Yeah, cut, rewind. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I should have remembered that. You know, silly me. You know, everybody's going to say, "Mark, your history knowledge is <laughs> deteriorating." <laughs> yes, I loved uh, working for Lampoon. I loved it. Mm -hmm. Now, did you do like uh, many of the other contributors? You just submitted things through the mail. You never really went to their offices and stuff like that. I went to their offices once. Okay, that was the very very beginning. That was when Lampoon had. I guess they'd already had several issues. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many, but it was the early 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and I was at a New York convention. That was how I started with Lampoon. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. It was the early 70s and I was at a New York convention and Michael O'Donoghue was there and mm -hmm. I was dying to be in Lampoon. So <laughs> I, 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 I just kind of all took all my courage in hand, you know, and and walked up to him and said, hello, Michael O'Donoghue, my name is Trina Robbins, and I sure would like to be in, that, in, in Harvard Lampoon. Mm -hmm. And he went, Harvard or National? I went, National? Sorry. <laughs> and, and we just made an appointment. I visited him in the Lampoon offices. He introduced me to everyone. He assured me that M.K. Brown was a woman, and so mm -hmm. they were not sexist. Yeah. Um, and that's how it started. Mm -hmm. and um yeah that's right you've been in there i'm doing the same faux pas you said harvard lampoon instead of national i forgot exactly. you were in there and it's like no you were in there many many times yes. you know for some reason you know and i have all the issues i have issues but i have all the issues from 1970 through the end of the run in 98 i know you were long gone by that point you know but it's like um uh yeah uh so I don't even know where to go from this, <laughs> you know, because I'm embarrassed when I always uh, make a faux pas. Uh, at the time, also, there were other publishers, and I know you were kind of vaguely involved uh, with Jim Warren and Vampirella and things like that. So, I mean, all I did was design her costume. Right. And I described it to Frank Frazetta over the phone. Mm. And that's how he drew her. Mm hmm. So you didn't actually work for them. I drew so. nothing for them. No. Okay. I thought maybe somewhere along the line you might work for Warren as well, just because. No, but we 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 still exchange Christmas cards. He's a very sweet man. Oh, okay. So you do get along with Jim Warren. Oh, Some yes, people said he absolutely. was really tough and you know hard nosed and stuff like that, and maybe he was to people who work for him or something. <laughs> he was. A, he is a very sweet man. Okay. I've never met him, actually. The only, the closest I've met to anyone working there, other than yourself, uh, and you only did peripherally, was maybe Forrest J. Ackerman, and uh, I think I met Bernie Wrightson somewhere along the line, but, you know, most of the time, you know, I, I never even met Harvey Kurtzman, and I, like, I always wish I could. Oh, Harvey was a dear, a dear, dear man. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me see. So... I want to talk about your influences a little bit before I talk about your books, because I was looking through another book. I tried to do as much research as possible. Um, of course, uh, you came to my Harvey Art Show, which is about a decade and a half ago now. Jeez. Uh, and you uh, wore a dotted uh, dress, which I never asked you. Did you design that yourself for that night? I don't remember the dress that I wore. But I love polka dots. I have a lot of polka dotted dresses yeah. in my closet. I believe it was a white dress with red dots and just as simple as ah. that, just all over. But I, I didn't know if you still, still don't remember it. Yeah, I, I don't know if you still design all your own clothes or if you. Uh... I don't anymore. Okay. I don't anymore, but I'm, I'm the queen of thrift shoppers. Okay. <laughs> But um, it said in this one book I read uh, that your influences were like a lot of the female comics and uh, like Millie the Model, Patsy Walker, Patsy and Hetty and, uh, you know, and even the Harvey stuff, Dot, Lotta and uh, Audrey and stuff like that. So, um, and of course, Wonder Woman. And uh, did you tend to just gravitate to that because you always were interested in female characters or did you basically read everything but those are your favorites 
No, I was only interested in female characters. I didn't buy, when I was a kid, buying comics on my own. Um, I didn't buy any of the comics that were about men. I had no interest. You know, I take it back. There was this wonderful comic. It was Frankenstein. I can't remember who drew it now, but it was very, it was funny Frankenstein. Oh, I liked the Dick, that. The Dick Briefer ones? Yes. Oh, yes. okay. Yeah. I liked that. <laughs> but I didn't buy any of the superheroes. I thought they yep. were really boring. I, I was only interested in, in women and mm -hmm. still am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, well, it's, it's tendency for me. I, I you know, I, I, you know, still like Casper and Richie Rich and things like that, the male characters. But of course, I tend to, you know, I did read Spider-Man and I read Superman and stuff like that. But nowadays, you know, I don't read any of the superhero stuff because it just bores me. I'd rather. Exactly. Just... It's incredibly boring. Yeah. And also, you know, I, when, when I got old enough to think about why I didn't like them, I realized that the message they give kids is really awful because the message is if you disagree with somebody, if you don't like what someone else is doing, you don't talk it out. You immediately use your fists. Yeah. You know, it's fight, immediately fight. And of course, those comics, you know, they're all fight scene, you know, and right. and 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 sugar, you know? Yeah. White I I think I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that's what turned me off on it. I didn't dislike like we mentioned the batman tv show you know that was fun i, and I always it. loved that because it was yeah. comical stuff and you know when they did the fights you know they had the big biff pow you know coming up on the yes. screen yes. and it was basically silly nobody bled nobody really That's got right. hurt you know nobody got shot you know uh you know things like that so it, it was fun you know but in general yeah I, I'm with you I, I tended to like the Harvey stuff because it was cute and they got into interesting adventures I liked Tintin I liked uh the Archie stuff because I liked the relationship stuff and and the humor but what I liked about Archie was Betty and Veronica yeah. not really necessarily Archie and yeah. you know I've spoken to other women about what comics they read were when they were kids. Mm -hmm. And so many of them said, oh yeah, I read Betty and Veronica, not Archie. They would even, that was before there were Betty and Veronica comics, but yeah. still Betty and Veronica were the big interest, interests in, Harp, in, in Archie comics. And yeah. so they would, they would not say, oh yeah, I read Archie. They would say, oh yeah, I read Betty and Veronica. Yeah, I tended to read the, Archie as a, whole meaning you know and for a time like in the 80s and 90s i got all the titles i loved it so if it was josie if it was uh <laughs> that wilkin boy <laughs> it didn't matter jughead whatever i got all the titles so but uh uh i never had an issue one way or the other probably because the earliest comics i ever had was a little smattering of everything i had a casper comic i had a wendy comic i had a scooby-doo comic i had this that and the other and it's like i never really thought about it that way and I never really considered myself being a feminist or not being a feminist, but I was always open to all sorts of ideas. And Well, I had never heard the term feminist and I didn't think of my, I mean, I was a kid. I yeah. didn't think of myself as a feminist. I just knew what I liked. Yeah. And what I liked was the comics that starred women. Yeah. And did doing all that and even drawing what you uh drew over the years and doing women's comics and things like that did that propel you into learning more about the history behind it and doing all yes these of stories? course of course because you would hear guys say oh women never drew comics <laughs> and i knew that wasn't true i knew it you know just like i also knew what other thing was not true was this well girls and women don't read comics and I knew that was bullshit, you know, because I and all my girlfriends growing up read comics. Right. And I knew we weren't like a little enclave but that was that was different from the rest of the world. Yeah. I think that mythology kind of came out later with the advent of the actual comic book store. You know, once comic book stores came in, you know, the mythology, which is was actually true for quite some time, that only boys or men uh, you know, enter those abodes as it were you know came true but yes um 
I don't know. Did women get into, you can tell me more than me. Uh, 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 did women get into collecting? And I mean, for like profit uh, as much as boys did or not. Um, well, when I was a kid, none of us got into collecting for profit. Right. We didn't know about that. In fact, I don't, I still don't know if my school was unusual or not, <laughs> but in my grade school, elementary school, which was a K to eight. Um, on the last day of school, all the kids would bring comic books to class and they would trade comics hmm. and read them. That was what we did on the last day of school and it was completely approved of. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> I, yeah, I know from talking to my dad my dad's still around and uh, he's around your same age and uh, he uh, said, you know, you didn't collect comics per se. I mean, you traded them. That's what you did. And if you yeah. ever saw them like in an antique store or a junk store, they were a nickel. You know, that's yeah. what they're worth. You yeah. know, they weren't worth thousands of millions of dollars. Exactly. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and um, the last thing my dad collected, he, he stopped when he was a teenager, was the original Mad in the early 50s. And uh once Mad turned to a magazine, he turned, he got the first one and he didn't like it as much as the comic. It wasn't as good. It was yeah, never and, as good as the comic. Yeah. So he just said, eh, I'm done. I'm I'm 17 or whatever, you know, I'm done anyway. And he he gave them all away with me as a little kid. I go, you gave all the mads away. <laughs> <laughs> they were wonderful, yeah. but I didn't save them either. Yeah. You just didn't. Yeah. And, you know, it, 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 since I grew up in the early 70s where you know, I mean, I was born in the 60s, but in the 70s, when I found out, oh, these are worth money, then, you know, I was saying, didn't you want to keep them? I was like, yeah, they weren't worth anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I said, I but they're funny. Wouldn't the worst... you want to keep them for that? And yeah, I read them already. That's enough, you know. <laughs> like... I think one of the worst things that happened to comics was saving them so that you could make lots of money on them. That's yeah. a terrible thing. Comics are to read. Yeah. But I'm just surprised. Like, I probably would. It, I always think that I would have done this is had I been around when Matt originally came out, I would have kept them not for value is just, they're really funny. Those Kurtzman ones. I, you know, and of course I've since collected all of them. And, uh, you know, the last one I needed was issue number one and the aforementioned Lee Hester, he, he says, you should get issue one. And I go, well, I have it in a reprint. I have it in the Russ Cochran volume. I have it in a magazine. I don't need it. And he goes, nah, you know, you need it. You need all of them. <laughs> and he convinced me to pay it over time. And it's the most I've ever paid for a comic book, which was $400. And I'm like, oh, oh. my God. No, I, I am fine with the reprints. Yeah, I'm I was fine, fine with the that. reprints too, but he just said, you gotta get it. You know? <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah, so I do have it. And the good part about it is it did uh, end up in a uh, museum e exhibition for EC Comics briefly oh, cool. about five years ago. So at least I had some use for it for a while. Um, so let's uh, continue on with uh, some of your books. Which was your first uh, history book? Was it just the general... Uh, women in uh, comics. Women and the comics. Yeah. Co-written okay. with Cat Ironwood. Okay. And she's a wonderful person too. That yeah. was uh, 80, 85, I think, 86 maybe. Mm -hmm. And when you did that book, was it difficult? I mean, there's a few people that were around and we knew about, but it was a difficult finding research about them, especially in the pre-internet days. It was very difficult, and a lot of the research we we found was turned out to be incorrect. Um, there were no computers, or maybe they were, but they were those huge, huge things that took up a whole room and punched out code, you know. Right. <laughs> um, so there were no computers for us to use for research. And research was very hard. And like I say, a lot of us turned out to be incorrect. There was a group in Los Angeles that were fans of illustrators. And they would, each one of them would put out a kind of like a folio about specific illustrators. And there was one on Nell Brinkley and it was completely wrong. They even got her hair color wrong. Wow. <laughs> and so how, how did you end up getting the, 
more correct the correct version uh of her life wow well the nell brinkley story is just is is it's an example of the fact that i think there's a comic goddess uh, and the comic goddess is looking over me mm -hmm. because of the way this is must have been like the middle 90s when i finally got a computer mm -hmm. and a friend of mine forwarded an email, I never found out where she got the email, but she forwarded it to me. And what it said was basically, my mother was a Nell Brinkley fan all her life and saved all her Nell Brinkley pages. And she has passed away and her stuff is piled up in my garage. And I would like to give it to someone who knows Nell Brinkley. Wow. My God. So I, I emailed her back and I said, I know Nell Brinkley because I already, I mean, all I knew was that she was a woman, you know, mm -hmm. and I had yeah. some examples of her art, but mm -hmm. not, not what I later got. I, I said, I know Nell Brinkley and I would love to be the recipient of this collection, but I have to warn you, I'm a writer and I'm very poor. <laughs> and she said oh no i wouldn't dream of charging you i want you to have this oh very cool and she drove it over now she could have been this is the computer you know this is the internet she could have been anywhere in the world she was like a 20 minute drive away from where i lived in wow. san francisco and she brought it over and it was this huge pile of really neatly filed scrapbook with plastic pages you know pockets inside where you put the art very neatly put together and this woman her mother who was the Nell Brinkley collector had things that she had written she actually did Nell Brinkley's horoscope um, wow. so, so her daughter gave me everything everything wow. <laughs> and I just sat there on the floor surrounded by all this stuff it's just amazed amazed at what i had found and mm -hmm. what this wonderful woman has given me and every time i have used nell brinkley in my books mm -hmm. i always talk about gail heckeland who is the woman who's who's most most of the nell brinkley stuff that i got but all had belonged to gail heckeland wow <laughs> I even when i was when i was doing my research Mm -hmm. And reading this stuff, I was even talking to her because I knew she must be hovering around. It's just saying things like, oh, you were right. You're absolutely right. How did you know? And, you know, <laughs> it's just incredible. Did you find out uh, how she became a fan of Nell's? Oh, Nell had so many fans. That was not a surprise. Mm. Women loved her, men loved her too, but women especially adored her. And they used to collect her work and save it in scrapbooks. Girls used to color in her black and white stuff. I have some examples of that. Black and white, Nell Brinkley printed pages that were colored in by some, some girl, you know, back in like, like 1914. You know, and right. even draw, they would copy her style. I have examples of art, original mm -hmm. pencil drawings by 14 year old girls. And I've, I have found the Nell Brinkley published pages that this girl was copying. Hmm. It's just fascinating to me because see, that's a part of history and I need to read all your books, I think. I've only read a few, uh, but um, the, the thing that I find fascinating is when you go back that far, that there was some sort of fandom. I mean, I'm surprised there was fandom was for other things. You know, she that, was a superstar. Yeah, she was a superstar. Um, what also among the stuff that Gail Hegeland had was newspaper articles, clippings of newspaper articles about Nell Brinkley. Wow, <laughs> she was a superstar, hmm. and now you know, and all these guys were saying, "Oh." There were no women drawing comics. Well, she there she was. Yeah. And more too. I mean, there were more women. Yeah. But you know, um, she's a great example. Right. I mean, one of your books, I think, is pretty uh um, well, we'll talk about the flapper cartoonist, but I mean, uh, you know, you talk about uh 
like pretty in ink I, you know i need to read this with my glasses up <laughs> pretty in ink is kind of like an update of that other uh women in yes, car- women is. cartoon yeah. is. so um you talk about ethel hayes edwina dum uh of course remember ramona freighton and dale messick and uh current ones like uh, or more current ones like linda berry and carol tyler i wrote all these people down because i wouldn't remember when i get to the podcast here um you know the more recent ones obviously you can just call them up and say hey how's it going what you know tell me your history like i'm doing with you but i mean you know some of those other ones uh were they as similarly difficult to get the research one on the older ones like that or did you have not stroke of, not, lo- stroke of luck <laughs> um not once i god bless the internet and and computers you know um for some of them i just researched you know you can you can see old newspapers you can read old newspapers mm-hmm. you know on your computer screen you know you can get you can your library your local library probably has has you know, all of these old newspapers for you to research. Right. And of course, there's a website, I don't know if you've used it, the newspapers.com, which has the archives that way. That helped me for, uh, that helped me for my chipmunks book, because uh, (laughs) there wasn't a lot of stuff written, strangely enough, in books about Ross Bagdasarian, but you know, on old newspapers, there it is. It's like, you know, so (laughs) it's funny that nobody else ever does research. And um, let me ask you this, and I think I know the answer, and there's a similar book, and I interviewed this man as well as Ken Quattro when he did his recent book, Invis- Invisible Men. Um, yes. Do you lo- enjoy uh, discovering this stuff? I would assume so. <laughs> oh, of course. Are you kidding? It's so exciting. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I was writing, really, the first one, when I was, no, I think the second one. Um, which was called A Century of Women Cartoonists. And at that point, I had a computer and I had the internet, you know, even though there was much less in those days than there is now on the internet, but still enough. And I discovered that, um, let's see, what was her name? Not Ethel Hayes. Um, Something I can't think. Can you hold on one minute? I'm I'm just going to look her name up. Okay. I'll be right back. All right, that's fine. <laughs> While we're sitting here, yes, uh, you know, I just want to let everyone know to go out and buy many of Trina Robbins' books. They're all excellent reads. Uh, they're very historical, very, very well researched, and very well thought out. So, uh, if you uh, want to know anything about women's Grace history, Drayton. comics, I'm giving you Grace a plug Drayton. here. <laughs> Okay, who is um, it? Grace Drayton, okay. who was one of the very first women cartoonists, started in about 1903, was incredibly prolific, drew until she died in 1946. Well, what, what I discovered was that Grace Drayton not, was not the only one of her family who drew comics, but her sister and her daughter also drew comics and that they all drew in a similar style. Wow. And when I made that discovery, I just was so excited. It was like, it's archeology, span you know? Yeah, yeah. I've had similar experiences like that. So I assume as a fellow historian, you would have had similar ones, but it's, it's fun to hear you say, yes, you know. <laughs> and you know, I always wanted to be an archeologist when I was a kid. It was one of the things I wanted to do. And I am an archeologist. Yes. Which leads me to ask, I mean, you know, since we're kind of discussed everything now, I mean, what did you want to be the most or did you want to be all these things and you ended up being a clothing designer, a writer, an artist? Did you want to be all those things or was there one specific thing? Okay, you wanted? I definitely wanted to be an archaeologist. I wanted, I wasn't thinking in terms of comics, but I wanted to write books and illustrate them. And that really is what comics are. Um. I think those are the two things I wanted to do. Did you ever want to be an archaeologist in the sense of like, you know, excavating? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I wanted to dig, dig in, in ancient Egyptian tombs. I wanted <laughs> to find lost kings and queens. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
did you ever do anything of that in your lifetime? Never. Oh. Never, never. <laughs> but I'm but, sure you know, you've read about it probably and watched TV uh, yes. shows. Yes, well, I, I read, I was, I was an omnivorous reader and I still am an omnivorous reader. It's, as soon as I finish one book, I start another. I'm always reading. Mm -hmm. um, I discovered ancient Egyptian, you know, ancient Egyptian history and mythology. And I loved it. I loved it. Like in school, they taught us a bit of, of the Greek and Roman gods, you know, mm -hmm. later when we got a little older in high school, we read the Odyssey. Um, but that wasn't just interesting. For one thing, I didn't know that they actually painted their statues because the paint had all, of course, has all disappeared. Mm -hmm. So I just saw them as just, they're just white and boring, you know, and all dressed in white sheets. And it wasn't as interesting, you know, mm -hmm. but then I discovered ancient Egypt on my own you know, not in school. And it was incredible. You know, the colors, the colors are so incredible. And I just loved it. And I def I wanted to dig up ancient tombs, definitely. Was it always the art, like, say, the hieroglyphics and things like that on the wall that attracted you? Yes, or was it, it just it was everything? the art. Of, it was the art, certainly. Mm -hmm. So, um, now, um, other things that you've done uh, based on all that is you've actually done uh, some histories of women that aren't artists, but right. they are pro prominent women. Uh, how right. did those come about? I think Amelia Earhart was one. I'd have to look. No, I didn't one. do Amelia Earhart. Oh, I thought you I did. did. Um, Coleman. See, everyone knows Amelia Earhart, yeah. but I'm not that she isn't incredible and wonderful. And, you know. But oh, I know which this, one you did. I'm sorry. You did Hedy Lamarr. I you know, did do Hedy yeah, Lamarr. That one you did, yeah. <laughs> I wrote and, these and, things down and I probably wrote it down wrong, but yeah. <laughs> and Bessie Coleman, yeah. uh, who yeah. was, uh, that one was illustrated by Ken Stacy, who's a wonderful cartoonist, right. Canadian. And um, she was a, a black stunt pilot. So how did you find out about first, her? The first black woman to get her pilot's license. And she had to go to France to get it, to learn to fly because they wouldn't teach her in America because she was black and because she was a woman. They would not teach her. So she had to do it in France. Wow. And just in order to survive, she became a stunt pilot. Hmm. Uh, and she flew these, the only planes she could afford, which were really outdated. And one of them, um, something went wrong with the steering or something like that. I forget now, because I don't have the comic in front of me. And she fell out of the plane. They didn't have, they didn't have belt, safety belts. They didn't have them. They didn't think of it, you know? <laughs> um, did she live? I have not read that one, no. but did she, she live did not, to- a, she, did, oh. she didn't live. Um, you know, I've read about women pilots, early women pilots, because that's something that fascinates me ever since I first discovered Amelia Earhart. Yeah. And, you know, not one of them died in bed. None of them died in bed. Wow. Um, is it just because of the love of the flying or because of the adventure? What? <laughs> oh, the adventure. Yeah. The adventure. And they were just, wow, Harriet Quimby who was the first American woman to get her pilot's license. She had to make, a. she was a very small woman and I can relate because I'm a small woman. <laughs> and she had to get a pilot's suit, a flying suit made specifically for her. So she had it made out of purple satin. <laughs> you can just see her in that plane wearing her purple satin jumpsuit. And she also fell out of the plane, by the way. She died mm. very young wow. and she was so beautiful. Hmm. It was a stamp. It was a, a postal stamp for her, I think in the nineties, maybe the eighties. Mm -hmm. well, at least they're honoring these people nowadays. You yes. know, because yeah, yes. for the longest time, a lot of that stuff was just brushed under the carpet or never known in the first place. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, people really still don't know about these women. You know, you have to find the books and read them. Has there been any uh, women, cartoonists or otherwise, that you discovered completely on your own? I don't know if that's possible, but I mean that there was like really 
nothing about them, but you found it in some sort of archives, uh, would that be Nell or would that be somebody else? Uh, that you there wasn't anything and you just you could say oh, I discovered this person <laughs> or rediscovered this person um I'm not sure I mean because if they were published it was stuff known about them you yeah. know they weren't completely unknown I rediscovered really kind of rediscovered Lily Renee mm -hmm. um you know nobody knew if she I thought she was dead I thought she'd been long dead until mm. I got a um, email from her daughter saying, mm. hi, this is Lily Renee's daughter. I knew that my mother had drawn comics when she was younger. And so I wondered if there was anything on her in the internet. And I looked her up and your name kept popping up. And mm. I was, oh my God, I was so excited. Oh my God, Lily Renee is alive. <laughs> it was fantastic. So I mm. wrote an article about her. I interviewed her and wrote an article about her for I think the Comics Journal. Mm -hmm. And someone read it and it inspired them to interview her and write an article in Newsday. And soon everybody was writing about Lily Renee. She's still with us. She's 100 years old, lives in New York. Mm -hmm. And R Ramona Fredon is still with us, too. Is she like 90s? God bless her. I think Isn't she's she like 95. 95, yeah. I was saying 95, 96, somewhere around there, yeah. Still drawing yeah. and so good, so good. Yeah, um, but yeah, it, it's like, well, it, it's just kind of a funny thing uh, that I've noticed, which is a good thing, you know, it's like um, uh, a lot of people who are artists tend to live very long lives. Like um, uh, when I interviewed Mary Fleener recently, uh, we discussed her mother for Wait, a while. Can you hold on just a minute? Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Casey. Hi, I'm just going to interview right now on Zoom. Okay. Bye. <laughs> how dare they interrupt our interview? <laughs> That's how it is. It's very casual here on the Fun Ideas podcast. That was my daughter. We're, we're putting up a gate for our chickens. Okay. I was going to ask you about that too, but we'll get to it. We have chickens. So, so ha what I talked about with Mary Fleener is her mother. I don't know if you know her mother worked for Disney briefly in the early 40s. Uh, I think I, I think she told me. Yeah. And uh, her mother's going to be 100 uh, very soon. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So, and uh, it's just that, you know, it seems like a lot of artists and animators and things like that live very, very long lives, you know? <laughs> and so uh, do you do you have any insight on that? Is it because- I the have no on insight. Life? I know okay. that I wanna make it to a hundred. I and, think you will. And after that, I can, I can fall upon my keyboard and they'll find me at the computer. <laughs> um, before I talk about your chickens, because I do want to ask you about that. Um, at this point in your career, do you just enjoy doing these type of uh, biographies and histories and things like that? Or oh, is, there more, is there more comic book work in you? I know you did Wonder Woman and Honey West in recent years and things like that. Uh, well, I'd like to write more comics, but I haven't gotten any offers. Okay. I'm dying to write more comics. Or even ones on your own of your own creation. I mean, uh, when you when you deal with the different publishers, like you do a lot of work with Fantagraphics and stuff like that. Do, I love do they, Fantagraphics. Do, does Gary or anybody over there say, "Let's do a Trina Robbins collection" or do a new graphic novel or anything like that? Or is there more just interest in your history books? Gary is a pleasure, and and he's published many of my histories, yeah. but I don't. I don't know if he's interested. He has certainly never told me hmm. he's interested in comics and by me. I mean, yeah. and I know he likes my work. I mean, he has told me, he has said, you know, what, what's next? You yeah. know, um, I haven't gotten any offers. I offer, please make me an offer, you guys who are out there. Because I think, you know, even the book you did, um, Last Girl Standing, Mm -hmm. I mean, which was basically your autobiography. Um, I would love to see a graphic novel version of that. I mean, because like I said, going into this, your life is so 
varied and fascinating. <laughs> I don't know where to begin. I mean, that's what I would request if I was a publisher and had the money to do it. I'd say, I'd do your life story it. in a graphic version. <laughs> I'd have to draw it. And I'm really not drawing anymore. Oh, okay. I think that's what I was asking. I mean, do you do any sort of artwork or drawing much anymore? You, you do just more just doodles writing. when I'm on the phone. Okay, so you yeah, that I I think that's what I was really uh, driving at is more drawing than actual writing. I mean, obviously you're writing because books are coming out. <laughs> yes, and I'm still writing comics. You know, I just like I said, I haven't gotten any any offers. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, going back to that suggestion, you know, would there be if somebody was to illustrate your life story, let's say, uh, who would you like to do it if you had dream casting of course it has to be somebody's around you couldn't say somebody that's fast well you know i've worked with ann timmons a lot and she's mm -hmm. so good i always felt that she draws like me only better mm -hmm. so she is somebody i would definitely think of very good okay all right going from there because <laughs> One of the reasons we had to plan this on a, a, a morning time is you mentioned you had to feed your chickens. And yes. I thought, to be honest, it, when you first said that, I was I thought it was kind of a joke or something. And I go, what? You know, and then, no, you really have to put your chickens to bed and chickens things like that. In the backyard. So, so what do you have a whole, tell me your situation with your animals and things. My like situation that. with my chickens. Um, <laughs> We have a hen house for them, a little hen house. There's only two. It's a very small backyard. And, and my daughter, Casey, did the research and discovered that, that really we couldn't have more than two chickens in such a tiny backyard. <laughs> They're dear things and they give us eggs. One of them, Esther, is an Easter egger, Esther the Easter egger. And she <laughs> makes, she produces colored eggs. Would you like to see one? Sure. <laughs> this is really interesting is easter egg, lays easter eggs so anyway um i know uh trina's leaving the room but uh i will keep talking here until she makes her way back with an egg to show us uh if you're on the video podcast uh you know i'm sitting here talking to you oh there it is <laughs> Can you see it's blue? It is. Wow. <laughs> so do they all come out blue or do they come out different shades? Or? Esther's eggs are always blue. Okay. And Spreckles produces pink eggs. Hmm. Is there a reason for that do you, that you know of? or Different, different chickens produce different eggs. Okay. Because I know like hummingbirds and uh, robins or whatever, the blue. You know. Oh, yes. Robins egg blue, of course. Yeah. yeah. Well, Esther the Easter Egger gives us blue eggs. Interesting. I guess I don't see those for sale. I usually see white or brown. No, so. you know, probably if they were to to sell them, they'd probably charge an arm and a leg because yeah. everyone would want colored eggs. Yeah. I assume if you're eating them, they, they taste the same. They taste like, the same. Yeah. <laughs> but they're just so pretty. <laughs> they taste like blueberries. You know? <laughs> no. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, do you have any other pets or animals? I think you mentioned cats. I have two cats uh -huh. and a goldfish pond. Oh, okay. Very cool. And uh, uh, you're still with Steve Leolo after all oh, these? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> How's he doing? He's doing great. I just, I brought him coffee at 10 o'clock to wake him up. He, he works late at night and he sleeps late. Is he still producing comics at this time? Oh or? my God, yeah. He's he's currently inking, Fables is coming back. Oh, okay, And cool. he's currently inking the next issue. Very cool. I'll probably have to get him on this show next. <laughs> you yeah. do, you do. And um, you know, let's see, is there any other things? Let me go through my list here. And I just wanted to ask you about um, a few books. This one I did read from years ago and uh, from girls to girls, I don't know yes. how to pronounce because <laughs> it's for me. I just always girls. call it from girls to girls, but yeah, yeah it's girls. Sure. You know, um, what, uh, how did that book come about? I mean, it's the same type of thing, but I mean, it's a different take on uh, women. Well, I wanted to write about the, all the books that 
because you know those were the days when I wrote that I think it was the 90s was it, yeah, it, was um, it says, that's yeah. when they were that was the height of the the no women reading comics bit the oh girls don't read comics. I mean, it was incredible. It was like it was like a myth. You know, one of the things that they said it was also about TV shows that they said, well, girls will watch animated Saturday morning animation in which the heroes are boys, but boys won't watch animation in which the heroes are girls. You know. Again, bullshit. Girls were reading, bullshit. were watching <laughs> animation where the heroes were boys because there was no animation where the heroes were girls, yeah. you know. And girls weren't reading comics because there were no comics for girls to read. You know, if there are comics for girls, they'll read comics. And that was so that I talked about all the comics there had been for girls, all of them, you know, and that, that they had been so successful until really the 60s when when Marvel and D switched to superheroes, you know, and slowly the girls comics just died. And that, that's why girls weren't reading comics. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to write about that. So I wrote about that. Yeah. I mean, I've never had a problem with it. I don't know if I'm unique in that way, but I mean, it's of course like, you're look, not. No, of course you're not. Yeah. You but know, I mean, we, it's like when I was a kid, I read Wendy as much as Casper. I read Little Lulu. I read, uh, you know, Dot oh, Lot and Lulu, Audrey. Yeah. Um, who's the other ones? Uh, I read Nancy and Sluggo. <laughs> I'm trying to think of girls, you know, and if there was a girl character, it, you know, it was, I, you know, I was always fascinated with Dennis the Menace and like Margaret in there. And, you know, it's like, but I never shied away. You know, I bought Wonder Woman comics too and, you know, things like that. I never, I never thought about it until later when people pointed out things like, you know, you know, things like you're saying, you know, it's like, oh, girls don't read comics. And I go, could have fooled me. My sister read comics. She didn't yeah. stay in it. But, you know, now that she knows that I write all these books and everything, she's kind of fascinated by it. And uh, she will, you know, give me little, you know, emails and letters. And it's like, have you seen this? Do you know about this? And I go, you know, wow, I didn't know this. Or maybe I did. But, you know, hey cool thank you you know <laughs> uh, but uh yeah I, I i don't know but yeah i you know do know looking back on it yeah there's a predominance of male characters which i guess makes sense because there's m traditionally more males in the industry but um you know i i <laughs> um now you said you didn't go to the um the big two or any of those uh standard comic book publishers because you're more counterculture and things like that um but do you think women in general from doing your research just had trouble over the years getting into the well, mainstream comic book industry or was they just didn't have an interest because they want to do other things with their art well they used to as you know um they used to be drawing comic books too you know during the war when the men were off fighting the women you know in every every field you know from from driving trucks and buses to building ships and planes to drawing comics the women entered the field right. and they were fine they you know they were good artists but yeah. what what happened in I, I think, you know, starting in the 70s, maybe, I think maybe the 80s is when it started, maybe the late 70s, when everyone moved, when it all moved to comic stores, you yeah. know, when you couldn't just get your comics at a corner corner grocery or a corner drugstore, um, that the comic stores were run by, by men, you know, who were comic fans, and they had loved superhero comics, and that was all they wanted to carry was superhero comics. Yeah. You know, and if if, <laughs> if you can't find the book, you then you're not going to read it, obviously. That's true. And then they're then they're going to say, oh well, girls don't read comics. Well, you know, they weren't carrying the comics that girls liked. Right, but um, I wanted to ask again. You know, it's like. Um, like I said, you didn't try to go to Marvel or DC or anything like that no. because of the kind. But do you know of women that had any sort of it? Like, oh, you can't work at Marvel because you're a woman. And did you read no, no, or hear of any stories that of that during the fifties or sixties or anything like that? No, no. Okay. 
um, what happened, of course, was that the war ended and the boys came back and they got their jobs back and the women were sent back to the kitchen, you know, because the boys were more important. Yeah. Well, that actually happened again, in, you know, for black men as well, because in that Invisible Men book, you know, when I was interviewing Ken, he said that exact same thing is that they actually came in during the war and then after the war it's like we don't need you bye bye you know yeah and that's right a few stayed in but uh, most didn't or they had to find other avenues for their art like advertising or something else you know and uh or painting or whatever you know it's like so did any women stay in uh from the world war ii time i mean no i of course we're saying ramona and people like that but i mean any others that i'm not remembering at the moment well ramona was post-war as was marie I thought, severin i thought she was in uh during world no, she war wasn't II drawing during war. the war no no oh, no okay. she's not okay. that old okay um <laughs> uh, i know she's marie severin enough. came in uh let's see who else is in there um uh, i can't think of any right now <laughs> but um but uh have you heard any stories from like uh marie severn or anybody like that i'm sure you talked to her that said that was difficult getting artwork published or anything like that it's like this is a boys club or anything like that um no ramona and uh, marie didn't have any problem but one thing is well Mar marie really did because when when stanley hired her it was originally just to you know to correct mistakes and erase pencil lines and and do coloring, you know, it was it wasn't until '66 that she actually he actually let her draw comics. Right. Um, but the thing is that they had a house style. DC and Marvel also they had a house style, this kind of superhero house style with the the fist, the forward fist, you know, and and yeah. just strange angles and. And, and also big muscular guys beating each other up. And women just don't draw that. Women, it's true, you know, it's true that women and men do draw differently. Yeah. And if you'll pick up some DC and Marvel comics today, you'll see that they look completely different because they're drawn by women. Yeah. Women have brought a new style, a different style into comics. It's not a new style because they always drew like that. Yeah. You know, they used to, Draws like a girl used to be an insult. Oh, she draws like a girl. You know, well, no, they do draw like girls and they draw great. Yeah. Draws it's, like a girl is great. It's a new style for a traditional format. How about that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <what> <laughs> um, so um, let's talk about your most recent one. You know, again, the Flapper Queens, you know, that I mentioned yeah. here. And uh so you kind of picked uh, basically six uh, uh, artists to focus on, and uh, we mentioned Nell, and then there's Virginia. How do you pronounce Bougier. that? Bougier. Virginia okay, Bougier. Okay. Okay. Um, and what do you have um, to say about her? Uh, you know, she was wonderful, and she's very under. She's not well known, and she's underappreciated. But she was extremely successful, and she was actually draw comics through the fifties. She. I, I have examples of very short stories, like just two pagers that she did for the romance books in like 1949, 1950. I recognized her style. She was great. She was great and people just don't know about her. She's yeah. the most underappreciated of the Flapper Queens. Mm -hmm. And then Edith uh, Stevens was one. Yeah, <laughs> now that, that was, you know, like I said, there's a there is a goddess of comics who, who <laughs> hovers over me. Um, I received um, mail from her grand nephew, who had read my books on women cartoonists, and he said, "You may not know about my aunt, my great aunt Edith Stevens," mm -hmm. and he sent me examples of her work. And I said, "Oh my God, she's a riot! I love her stuff, <laughs> and I love the fact that she was called the Kate Smith of the drawing board too, but she was a little tubby." Mm -hmm. um, so you know, it was great to feature her in my book. Mm -hmm. And the next one, and of course, uh, Ethel Hayes. Who, you yeah, know, that everyone, was the next one I was going to ask. They look at her work and they go, oh my God, she's incredible. Why did nobody know about her before? I would have done a whole book on her, but I just, 
it I don't have as much enough information. I can okay. only write about women, you know. Yeah, that was going to be one enough. of my questions is like, you know, would any of these uh, be able to fill out a whole book if you had enough information for it? No, except of okay. course for Neil Brinkley, who, right. you know, I did a book on her. Yeah. And that's why I, I put them all together in the Flapper Queens, because okay. they were wonderful, but I didn't have enough for an entire book. And then, um, I'm missing one, so you'll have to correct me, but I have Eleanor Shore. Yeah. yeah, she's really interesting because she started in the teens and she was drawing like Nell Brinkley. There were a whole list of women who were all inspired by Nell Brinkley and drew in that style, beautiful Art Nouveau style. But by the 20s, she had developed her own style, which was very Art Deco. And the stories are very cute and funny too. They're about this one specific flapper who, who wears her father's clothes. He, she wears his bathing suits and his socks. And it's very cute. And her father, of course, is this, this little bitty man. And she's this tall, gorgeous flapper. <laughs> now, other than in your books, where's the best place to see a lot of their artwork? Uh, which magazines and newspapers? My work is the only place to see their Unless mm -hmm. you, you, you can dig up, you know, old newspapers. Okay. I'm the only one who has reprinted them. Oh, wow. Okay. So <laughs> um, that's a really appreciated <laughs> by me because I always like, you know, for, I've always said this about other people who do comic art history and stuff like that. It's like, you did the book that I, I either say you did the book I wanted to do or you did the book I didn't want to do. <laughs> Uh -huh. uh, but I want it, you know, and, and you do the books that I don't necessarily, it's not that I'm against women comics, it's like, I just don't know enough about it, and you do it so well, it's like, those are the books I want to get, because you've done all the research, and now I can just take it and read it. <laughs> and I love research, I love research, yeah. that's the whole, the whole fun of writing them, is the research. And, uh, you know, that, and that's why I do for what I've done, you know, Harvey Comics, um, Archie Comics and things like that. You know, it's like I hope to bring something to the table that uh, somebody hasn't been able to, to read or see before. You know, I'm can't. sure you've seen Leslie Kabarka's book, The Harvey Girls. Right? Oh, yeah. Yes, I have. A, I wrote yeah. the introduction to that. Yes, I remember that. Now, now that I read the, I wrote the introduction to one of them. I think it was a hot stuff book of the series strangely enough because i'm not uh, the hugest hot stuff fan i like casper and richie rich more but hey you know i love the harvey stuff as you know so um and i did find you know doing my research on, i don't know if you ever saw my harvey comics companion but uh weren't too many female artists there either uh but there's some inkers and uh that was where they tended to be is that uh where a lot of women were in comic books as well is just inking. Inkers? Yeah. Um, I think that it might have been easier to get a job inking than drawing. Mm -hmm. yeah, because I, I can't think of all their names. Jacqueline Roche, I think is her name or something. She did a lot of the inking during the 50s and 60s. I'd have to look up my list. It's all in my book, but you know, um, I might send you a list and say, hey, here's your next book. Can you do something about these women? You know, so um, anyway, what, what are you working on now at this point in your career? Oh, um, and that is, is being designed right now and is going to be out in May. Um, and then I, I may be doing something. Uh, I don't want to talk about it because that's a jinx. Yeah, I, I agree with you on things like that. Um, and of course, you know, if somebody gives you the offer to write just, uh, you know, comic books. Yes, or, or, yes, or, yes, yes, yes. I want to write another graphic novel, please. Yeah. You know, I did, you know, I think, is it the Honey West one, the last one you did, or have you done something since? Um, might have been the last one I did. Okay, yeah, that was about six or seven years ago, I think, maybe longer, <laughs> you know. Um, so, um, I guess that's all, we, you know, I have really to ask you for today, but, you know, it's like, I could just keep asking you questions about, you know, people you've met, uh, books you've written, articles you've uh, seen, and all that stuff, but, I mean, uh, 
you know, I always try to end the show is basically, you know, uh, you know, if you're making any public appearances in the next few months, I know pandemic has kind of slowed things down and how people can contact you websites or anything like that. Um, I'm on Facebook and uh, you can even, you can ask me to friend you, but you have to remind me that you saw this, you saw me on Mark Arnold's blog, you know, uh, because I don't just friend anybody. I have right. to have some connection. Mm-hmm. Um, while I'm on Facebook, I don't have a website. I had a website many years ago and the Russians stole it. I don't really know if the Russians stole it, but somebody <laughs> stole it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And any personal appearances in the next few months or uh, in the next year? Um, I am in, in December and I think in February, I'm going to be at conventions. Just a minute, all. Let's see where they are. Okay. <laughs> Looking in my calendar. Okay, that's the easiest way. Because <laughs> it was, it was weird doing this pod. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I rely on on desk calendars. They're wonderful. Yeah. I still do that myself. I still have paper calendars. Even, you know, yes. I don't like putting things in my phone because I don't have them, always have my phone with me. It's kind of That's weird. That's right. My <laughs> desk calendar sits here on my desk. No. <laughs> and you have to charge it up. You know, it's like you have the desk calendar. All you have to have is the light. Open it up. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> okay. And on January the twenty second. I'm going to be at a convention in Frankfurt, Tennessee. Wow. <laughs> which I've never been to Tennessee. One reason I like going to these little conventions is that they want, I find I'm somewhere in the United States where I've never been, mm-hmm. you know, and that's great. And I, I thought I had said I'd be in something in December, but I don't see it here. Maybe it's postponed or rescheduled. <laughs> that's seven a lot. That's happened a lot, you know. I mean, when I started yes. doing this uh, podcast in 2018, you know, I interview various people. I don't interview people in comic book world, but I interview people in music and everything else, but um, just pop culture stuff in general. But uh, they'd say, "Oh, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here. I'm signing here. I'm uh, playing here." Da, 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 da. And then it all stopped, you know. And it's like, well, I was going to play here and be here, but it's all canceled. And now it's kind of starting to open up again, which I'm very Yes, happy it is. About. And I hope that by spring it's open because my favorite convention is the San Diego Comics Fest, not the San Diego Comic Con, which I also go to, and I hope to go to it this spring, but the Comics Fest, which is this much more user-friendly convention in San right. Diego. And that's usually in the spring. And I really hope to go to that again. Yeah. I think this very month, I think it's like next week when we're recording this in November, uh, I think this is the first San Diego one that they're trying to open up just to yeah, test the Yeah, we're not going to that one. Yeah, yeah. The, but, but I'm just saying it, they're, they're opening it up to test the waters because the, right, the, right. the big one from the summer, gone. And know? I hope the big one comes. I hope that works out because yeah. that's the one I'll be in. Okay. I think it will be. I think hopefully, knock on wood and air and everything else, uh, that uh, this pandemic, you know, we finally have gotten a hold of it and, you know, it'll finally be on the downslide. Well, so. also, I mean, they just have to make sure that only vaccinated people are allowed in. Of course, yes. Mm-hmm. I went to one small convention when I went down to California in October and it was just a Pleasant Hill location. But yeah, they, they wanted to make sure you were vaccinated there and wear a mask and everything. It yes. wasn't, but it wasn't San Diego, but I figured if I'm going to test the waters, I'll do it on a smallish one. A little one. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been to, that's what I've been to is a few small conventions, one in Rochester, New York, um, one in Concord, California, uh, mm-hmm. all of them small and, and they were fine. They were fine. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it's, you know, especially as we all get up in years, we got to take care and <laughs> all, oh, yeah. all watch our health here, you know, and just well, like sure. I said, I want to make it to a hundred. Yeah. Well, I, I wish you make it to a hundred as well. And uh, I want to thank you today for being my special guest. It was always a pleasure to talk to you and see you. And it was good to see you and talk to you again. 
and uh uh you know if uh whenever your next book or project is out you know i'd love to have you back and we can talk about that thank you mark it was a pleasure all right well have a good day and uh this is mark arnold with trina robbins and uh this thank you again for being on fun ideas podcast thank you mark bye have a good day